Hello, I'm Carol Ann Riddell, and this is Science and You. Topping our show today, a major discovery beyond Earth. You've probably seen the headlines. The news of TRAPPIST-1 and its seven planets has scientists and a lot of other folks giddy with excitement. We'll dig into what it all means and the search for life. But first, some background, courtesy of the experts at NASA. The big news is that around a very nearby cold small star, we found seven rocky Earth-sized planets, all of which could potentially have liquid water. For me, it's mind-blowing. The first time I saw what the system had in it, I just was like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and then I looked at the data myself, I'm like, yep, yeah, there they all are. It's just. I would have never predicted this. It's beyond, you know, anything I could have ever dreamt of. If you were standing on one of these planets, you'd actually see a lot of them sort of in the sky whipping by on these very short orbital periods. It is an excellent, fantastic discovery. And joining us now to explain more, Jackie Faraday, an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. So I got to start with, how excited were you to hear about this? Well, I, I, I will confess, I've known about it for some time. Ah. Because my, <laughs> well, my thesis advisor from graduate school was a co-author on the paper, and so whether he should have or he shouldn't have, because it was embargoed, he, he had told me about it a while ago. So I knew it was coming. Were and you so completely excited? I was, I, when he told me, I was a, a bit in disbelief. I had to make him repeat it, because I thought, there's no way. Well, so of course the big question is about whether or not there is life, and we've heard a lot about the potential for there being water on these planets, but what does that really tell us about the potential for there being life? As scientists, in looking at how our planet survives, it looks like water is the key ingredient to any kind of life that we have okay. here on this planet. I mean, clearly our bodies are composed of a lot of water. We need water to survive. We need to take in a lot of water. Yes. Um, but other life forms also on this planet require water to survive. So water and the right amount of light in order to have water bubbling on the surface, if you were to find that, you have a good shot at seeing if life existed on that world. So it's a broad definition. One of the things that we've heard about in terms of this TRAPPIST-1 star is that it's, uh, it, it's smaller and it's colder. Is that right? Yes. So what does that mean, though, in practical terms uh, compared to our star, to the way we live? So this is what I was alluding to that I was so shocked at because I study that kind of star. It's, um, it's got a spectral type, meaning we call stars by we give them letters which say mm -hmm. something about how hot they are and how right. big they are. So our sun is a G-type star, and this one is an M-type star. The M-types are actually the most common star in the entire galaxy. Hmm. You find them everywhere. Oh, I didn't, okay. Yeah, there are, they're everywhere. And um, so our sun isn't that common. It's a, um, I mean, it's a common-ish star, but if you were to look at the numbers by number, the M-type stars, they, out, they way outdo the number of solar-type stars. So, but they're, they're much less massive. So they, um, they come in at like half a solar mass and then less. This thing is 8%, um, 8% the mass of our own sun. And that is teeny tiny. Yet, from the material that it did have, out comes at least seven planets. But in TRAPPIST, it is this teeny little thing, like the little engine that could kind of thing, with not a ton of mass. And it's got seven right. around it. How similar are these planets to Earth? I've heard them described potentially as being rocky. I don't really understand why is that so significant. 
Well, so when we, we want to find rocky worlds in part because there's two kinds of worlds that we have in our own solar system. We've got terrestrial planets, which are the rocky worlds, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then there's gas giants. You want a rocky planet because you want a surface. You want to land something and stand on it. And so rocky planets, are they invoke that. So they're more likely to have some kind of life form on them, potentially? They're, they're more akin to the kinds of planets that we would foresee as having uh, life forms on them. And, and what else do we know about these planets? You mentioned before the habitable zone. Can you explain exactly what that is? And are all of these planets potentially in that habitable zone or just a few of them? So it's not all of them. The habitable zone around, and you can get a habitable zone around any star, is defined as the position, the distance away from the star that you need to be to get enough um, flux, radiation, heat, however, flux and radiation are just kind of the science ways that we talk about it, but enough heat from the star that it, um, you could have liquid water bubbling on the surface. Right. Okay. If it's too hot, you can't have it. It might evaporate right off. If it's too cold, it'll freeze, right. and you're not going to have it in liquid form either. So we also call it the Goldilocks zone. So mm -hmm. you get too close to the star, it's too hot. You get too far away, it's too, co uh, too cold. In the middle, it's just right. Like a lot of things in life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Earth is in the habitable zone, but key point, so are, Mer so, so are Venus and, uh, and Mars. What are some of, or a couple of the most interesting things um, about life on these planets, potentially, if there is life, that would be different from life as we think of it or as we know it? What would conditions be like, potentially? This star is very low mass, and it's also a lower temperature than our own, than our own um, uh, sun. And it gives off the majority of its light in the infrared. Our sun gives off the, uh, a lot of light in the visible. And so... You are getting integrated over the same, you might achieve the same temperature. However, your sky is going to look different. It look completely different. It would look very, very different. Yeah. And so it's interesting, you know, this kind of discovery invokes a lot of creativity in scientists where we start thinking outside of our own box. We're so focused on, is it in the habitable zone? Is it in the habitable zone? But now we start thinking, is it what kind of, what would it really like? Now that we found it, there's enough radiation yeah. in order to get liquid water, but okay, would photosynthesis change? How would, how would plants grow under a different kind of light? And so you, you do get um, interesting science papers that come out after this kind of discovery where we explore the, the consequences of the physics of that star. Uh -huh. Just so, one more question for you. What is next in terms of what are scientists going to look for to really figure out the answer to this question of whether or not there is life? So this particular system is a great target for the next generation telescopes. And what you want to look for is um, you, if you can get enough information from the light of the, the, the atmosphere of the planet, you can say something about uh, biosignatures, possibly of life. You look for ozone, look for oxygen, look for water. Uh, and so these are the steps that we take in order, to, in order to try and figure out what's going on in these worlds. Wow, amazing stuff. Well, Jackie Faraday, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. You're welcome. Really interesting. From other planets back to our own, we hear so much about protecting Earth, but how many of us actually do something about it? Tina Beth Pina met an unconventional environmentalist who wants to save the Earth one tree at a time. I want to make a smaller footprint, be responsible, uh, do something that matters. Meet Robert Rising, also known as the Black Lumberjack, whose company, New York City Slab, recycles trees that have fallen within 50 miles of the New York metro area. The first thing we create out of trees is raw material, which is lumber, slabs. From slabs, we sell those to other woodworkers, other builders, homeowners, DIYers. And we also build furniture with those slabs, whether it be tables, consoles, cabinets. And we basically take trees that come from municipalities, parks, recreational areas, but we don't take down trees. We only get trees that are already fallen down. 
Why did you start recycling trees and making it into furniture? Why was that so important to you? Because it was a way for me to give back. I started recycling the trees first, and I thought it was cool that I'm saving trees from this very wonderful city. And there's no real reason to go anywhere else because it's all right here. And I prefer to save local trees because they have a story, they're part of who we are. Trees not only have a story, but they are also the lungs of our planet. They breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. They can also provide wood, paper, fruits, medicines, and soil nutrients. Research has shown that trees have positive effects on asthma rates as well. So when a catastrophic event like Hurricane Sandy uproots nearly 10,000 trees in New York City, it's a huge loss, but Robert turns it into something positive for the environment. Now you're the exclusive lumber recycler of any of the trees from Hurricane Sandy. That is correct. And the way that that worked, um, having all of those trees come down in that storm and the city taken to Floor Bennett Field, that kind of made this a lot bigger because I was able to save something that no one else could. And I was able to provide something that no one else could because I cared. New York City Slab's yard is currently stocked with over 25 species of local New York City and Northeast native trees. How those trees are recycled, milled, and eventually transformed in the shop is an exact science. From the moment that tree is cut, it takes one year per inch to dry. The drying starts from the moment that tree comes off the mill. So how you take care of that tree from that moment affects the life of that board, of that lumber, of that material. After it sat in the yard for X amount of years, you put it inside the kiln, and the kiln reduces the excess moisture, and what that prevents is the tree moving, the board moving when it's in your home. When you recycle trees, you're actually allowing other trees to thrive. Those trees can in turn reduce ozone levels in urban areas, reduce runoff and erosion by storing water and breaking the force of rain as it falls, and reduce noise pollution. Plus, depending on the species of tree, its age and health, a mature tree can emit enough oxygen to wholly support two people. The fact that I'm doing something that is so close to preserving human life makes me feel good. Trees are a very, very intricate part of our everyday life that most of us probably take for granted. Robert's recycling ways caught Martha Stewart's eye this past October. Her American Made Summit, which recognizes up and coming entrepreneurs who demonstrate innovation and creativity in the fields of agriculture, manufacturing and design, honored Robert and his company. Yeah, that was a huge honor. And she's an absolutely fabulous lady. Yeah, she's very smart and, and hands on. To give you any tips? Her tips with saving more trees because she had 200 trees come down in a storm and she actually had a saw you come in and mill that for. And of course I told her the bigger stuff that the mobile mill can't get, let me know and, and we'll come in and take care of it. For Science and You, I'm Tina Beth Pina. Our next story almost sounds like something out of science fiction. If you remember the cartoon character Popeye, you know spinach is supposed to help make us strong. But what if spinach and other plants could be used to protect us? For example, by warning us about bombs or landmines nearby. Donna Hanover has more with a professor from MIT. He transformed a living spinach plant into an explosive detector. It can detect explosives uh, that are present in groundwater or explosive residues that contact its, its leaves. It can detect those, those chemicals and then send that information uh, as an infrared beam to your, to your cell phone. MIT professor Michael Strano says his lab was able to put extremely tiny nanotubes of carbon into the leaves of spinach plants. Then when chemicals like explosive residues were put in the groundwater, the plants pulled them up through the roots and stems to the nanotubes. Next, a laser light was pointed at the leaves. These carbon nanotubes fluoresce in the infrared, meaning that if you shine light on them, they'll, they'll shine light back in this infrared wavelength. Infrared light is light that's so red, your, your eye can't see it. That's picked up by a cheap infrared camera connected to a Raspberry Pi, which is a tiny computer like the one in your cell phone. 
that cell phone could then email another user. You've given the plant the ability to communicate. You could say that, yes. How do you put the nanotubes into the plant? You can basically use a needleless syringe, and if your nanoparticles are in a solution, you can just gently pressurize the syringe at the, uh, at the surface of, of the leaf, and then that pushes the fluid uh, inside the air spaces of, uh, of the leaf. We made two kinds of nanoparticles for the plant. Uh, one we coated with a, with a peptide that can recognize explosive molecules, and another we coated with, with a polymer that insulates the carbon nanotube from its environment. So taken together, uh, your cell phone sees two, two signals. One is a reference that, that doesn't change, and another that, that indicates how much of the explosive is, is in the plant. So what kind of explosives did the spinach plants recognize? We used a carbon nanotube that we functionalized to respond to any molecule that has a dinitro aromatic. It's a chemical structure that has a benzene ring. Explosives often have a benzene ring with nitro groups sticking off. These kinds of experiments are now being referred to as nanobionics. Professor Strano says it works because plants are actually good chemical analysts, they constantly self-repair, and they don't need batteries. Plants are monitoring very large areas of the, of the groundwater uh, below the soil, and they're constantly sampling it. Basically, the sun helps to evaporate water at the surface of the leaf, and that creates a pressure that then can pull water up. And this is all done just powered by, by the sun. Why did you choose spinach? We actually didn't just use spinach. We we've, were also working with arugula and watercress. We wanted to make, make sure that we could demonstrate that uh, we could do this on a wild-type plant, a, a, um, a plant that you would find in your garden or in your nursery, and transform it into this chemical sensor and communication device. People are very, very concerned about terrorism, about possible explosions. So there's a lot of interest in the idea of using your research to uh, be able to protect populations. It's possible that you could use technology like this to monitor public, public spaces. If you could have many of these plants uh, all spaced out, then you actually learn a, a surprising amount. You don't just learn where there is a, an explosive release, but where that chemical is going to spread. You know, you're a chemical engineer. You don't find a lot of chemical engineers dealing with plants. I became interested in plants um, in studying solar energy. So your viewers may be surprised to learn that, that plants, they know much more about their environment than, than they let on. That information could ultimately be very uh, useful for humans. Dr. Strano says a next step is to help plants measure and communicate a lot of things at once, like whether they're getting enough light and water to thrive, and whether there are pathogens or toxic chemicals threatening us. So the next time you go to a garden or a park, have a little extra respect. We may be able to learn a lot from what we thought were humble plants. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. If you're eating an apple, nibbling some strawberries, or even sipping a spiced pumpkin latte, you have the honeybee to thank. But bee populations, which are essential to our food supply, are now in trouble. Some states, including New York, are trying to protect these crucial pollinators. Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson tells us how. New York State has over 7 million acres of land dedicated to agricultural production from roughly 36,000 farms. Many of these farms produce apples, cherries, strawberries, and onions and pumpkins, among other products. And they have one thing in common. They rely heavily on pollination from bees to produce high yields of produce. We're number two in apple production nationally, and apples are certainly a crop that, uh, that is well known to be pollinated by um, managed honeybees. Cabbage, again, another one that we're second in, in production nationally, also pollinated uh, by, by uh, bees. Christopher Logue is the director of the Division of Plant Industry for the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Recently, his department was ordered to team up with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation by Governor Andrew Cuomo to form the New York State Pollinator Task Force. What we did is, is we put together a diverse group of stakeholders, including the beekeepers, uh, the researchers from Cornell, number of uh, non-government organizations that are involved in uh, environmental issues, uh, grower groups from across the state, trying to get a really broad view of what's going on out there. So what exactly is the problem? 
Well, according to the New York State Pollinator Protection Plan, managed beekeepers, also known as commercial beekeepers, are losing between 50 to 70 percent of their bees every year, and a drastic loss of bee population can have some negative effects on our food supply. About 30 percent of our crops are actually pollinated by either honeybees or some other type of solitary native bee. One of the reasons we're worried is, is, is the, those crops are very valuable crops uh, economically. They're also very valuable crops uh, from a nutritional standpoint. Um, they give us a lot of variety in our diet. Additionally, the loss of the bee population has led to higher prices for pollination services. While there's no evidence yet of higher prices trickling down to the consumer, the hike will eventually be seen in the grocery stores. What we've seen in apples and some of the other tree fruit crops across the country is, is that the, the cost of pollination, in other words, what the farmer pays the beekeeper uh, to bring the hives to the orchard for pollination, that cost has gone up. And so eventually, if not already, those costs will be reflected in the, in the price of, of the product that you buy in the grocery store or at the farm stand. The major concern for people like Logue is the reason for the massive losses in population for beekeepers. Something, Logue says, is very complex. We think that what's going on and causing uh, the losses is a is a lot of different stressors. Stressors like varroa mites, a parasitic mite that lives off of the honeybee, a widely used insecticide like neonicotinoids, habitat fragmentation, the splitting up of untouched areas to urban development, homogenized crops, and even climate. Some beekeepers will transport their bees to a warmer part of the country during the uh, winter months to sort of build them up. Others will keep their bees in the colder areas and, and overwinter that way, so there, there are potential differences there. There's stresses from leaving them in a cold place. There's also stresses from putting them on a truck and driving them a thousand miles. So it's a really complex, complex thing, and what we're trying to do is to tease out all of these different factors um, and get a sense of, of which ones are important um, for each beekeeper and then try to make some management recommendations for them to uh, try to solve some of those challenges in their own operations. A program that's been implemented to do just that is the Integrated Pest Management Program, or IPM. IPM also, um, you know, teaches the farmer identify the pest before they, they uh, uh, employ a control measure. It uh, incorporates um, weather modeling that helps to basically tell them when a pest may or may not be present and helps them to make the decision about what type of uh, management tool to employ. And if all goes according to plan, beekeepers and various other stakeholders will have mastered the four key points of the New York State Pollinator Protection Plan. Best management practices, habitat enhancement, research, and outreach and education. After that, Logue is optimistic that we will be able to manage bee losses at a much more sustainable level of 10 to 20 percent year over year. I think we are getting a better understanding of the problem. I think we're getting a better understanding of the questions we should be asking. We're not, um, you know, pre-directing or, or answering those questions before we have the research in place to support those answers. So we're not predetermining the outcomes of of the questions we're asking. We're asking the questions and we're, uh, we're empowering uh, the researchers to get those answers for us. This has been Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson for Science and You. We end our half hour with medical news. In order to properly treat any disease, you first have to get the diagnosis right. Andrew Falzone takes us to Northwell Health for an in-depth look at the steps doctors take to accurately diagnose dementia. Because there's no cure for dementia, learning that you have the disease can be devastating and sometimes even getting a diagnosis can be extremely difficult. We spoke to one longtime geriatrician who says that it doesn't take a bunch of fancy tests to get a very accurate diagnosis. They get concerned because they forgot where the keys to their car are. That's not dementia. 
Dementia is much more than that. Dr. Giselle Wolf-Klein has been a geriatrician for more than 40 years, and many of her patients have some degree of dementia. While memory loss is a common symptom across multiple types of dementia, it does not necessarily mean dementia is present. I will say that it's certainly not uncommon for me to find that the memory loss or so-called memory loss is actually linked to something totally different from dementia or Alzheimer's disease. However, when other symptoms accompany the memory loss, it may be time to seek a medical professional's advice. Those symptoms include short-term memory issues like repeating the same sentence or story or repeating daily tasks, a failing sense of direction, whether it's on the road or around the house, difficulty following storylines or conversations, difficulty with words, for instance, holding scissors but calling them tape, and confusion like not being able to recognize people's faces. Basically, the, this explains that you're losing your memory, but you're also losing your judgment. You're also losing some of your behavioral barriers. Unlike many other diseases, dementia does not show up on a scanner in a test tube. As a result, the people who spend the most time with someone suspected of having it can usually detect the changes and symptoms the best. There's been some excellent studies showing that actually the clinical diagnosis in other words, no test whatsoever. Just true history and physical exam is 96% accurate when you do autopsy follow-up. So getting a good history is absolutely essential. However, sometimes in the earliest stages of the disease, even the most experienced clinician can't make a diagnosis. That is when you may want to consider neuropsychological testing. So. I personally use neuropsychological testing in that sort of sandwich time that we often refer to as mild cognitive impairment, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, when something is just a little off, but the patient is still able to drive, to attend to their business and so on. They're just not sharp. Neuropsychological testing involves written and verbal questions that assess a patient's cognitive abilities. While it can take a number of hours to complete, it's non-invasive. And even if a diagnosis of dementia is confirmed, Dr. Wolf Klein says it's not an immediate end of the road. There are um, long gone memories that you can no longer share. You can always share the present. And in many ways, we, I think, in our society, don't fully appreciate the present for what the present is. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. And that's our show for today. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on Science and You.